Welcome everyone to this evening's program, Living Together, Working Together, Edward, Edward Viard and his mother. We're gonna begin the program with a land acknowledgement. The Portland Art Museum recognizes and honors the indigenous peoples of this region on whose ancestral lands the museum now stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Motlala, Multnomah, and Watlala Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin Kalapoya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, and many other Native communities who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also want to recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all Indigenous communities, past, present, future, and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. And additionally, I would also like to go over a bit of um, accessibility for the evening and a little bit of Zoom housekeeping before I give the floor to Mary Weaver Chapin. Um, so first, I would like to uh, take a look at this slide in terms of captions. Um, of course, the Facebook information on here does not apply. But for those of you here on Zoom, we do have automated real-time captions available. Um, and to access those, you're going to click the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of the Zoom window and choose show options. Or, sorry, show captions, excuse me. Um, once on, you can click the caption box with your cursor and you can move it around the screen uh, so that you can fit it to uh, the slides, your viewing of the slides. Uh, something that I also want to mention is that these captions are really awesome and they're really great, but um, they are automated. And so that means that uh, some of the words, some of the names and phrases for things um, are not always going to be correct. So please keep that in mind. Um, of course, we do make an effort to um, improve the captions uh, for the recording of this that will be posted on our YouTube channel later on. And in addition to captions, um, we also have ASL interpreters for this evening. Um, and I would like to thank our interpreters for the evening, uh, Sarika Metha and Dana Walls. And if you have any questions or need technical assistance regarding access, please notify us in the Q&A and we'll be happy to assist you. And finally, uh, the last bit of um, accessibility that I wanted to go over um, is that we also offer verbal descriptions of the speakers. Um, so for example, uh, I will do one for myself. Uh, my name is Jaleesa Johnston and I work in the Learning and Community Partnerships Department at the Portland Art Museum. And for my verbal description, I am a black woman. I am wearing a um, green sweater and a green shirt and I have on black rim glasses. I have black curly hair that is actually currently pulled back into a braid. And I am sitting in a, um, I'm sitting in a beige room. And that is my verbal description. And finally, before I hand it over to Mary, I just want to bring your attention to the Q and A box. If you have questions, please put them there and we will do our best to answer as many of them as possible uh, during tonight's program. Okay, finally, all that stuff is out of the way. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to uh, go ahead and give the floor over to my colleague, curator of prints and drawings, Mary Weaver Chapin. Thanks, Jaleesa, and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Mary Weaver Chapin. I'm the curator of prints and drawings at the Portland Art Museum, and I'm coming to you today from my office. I'm seated in an office full of books, and I am a white woman with curly dark hair and round glasses. I am also the curator of the exhibition currently on view at the Portland Art Museum, Private Lives, Home and Family in the Art of the Nabis, Paris, 1889 to 1900. And as we were conceiving of this exhibition, we wanted to bring in voices who had great expertise. And I was 
absolutely delighted when Francesca Berry agreed to contribute to our catalog. So it was um, an easy step to go uh, back to Dr. Berry and ask her to give a, a talk today to share her knowledge and her wonderful um, depth of understanding of the period uh, about this show. So the exhibition examines the beautiful, enigmatic, and oftentimes paradoxical work of four artists, Pierre Bonnard, Edouard Vuillard, Maurice Denis, and Félix Balaton. These artists sought to create an art of suggestion and emotion, and it takes a close look at the paintings, prints, and drawings of home, family, and children or what Bonnard referred to as the small pleasures and modest acts of life. Although their styles varied, each returned repeatedly to the motifs of home life and especially family. For Edward Vuillard, his mother was the prime source of inspiration. And today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Francesca Berry for a discussion of how Vuillard and his mother constructed a unique living and working situation. Dr. Francesca Berry is senior lecturer in the Department of Art History, Curating and Visual Studies at the University of Birmingham. Before joining Birmingham in 2005, Francesca studied for her undergraduate and postgraduate degrees at University College London. <clears throat> Excuse me. She proceeded to a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Royal College of Art and Victoria and Albert Museum. Francesca is currently chair of the editorial group of the Oxford Art Journal and has served on its board since 2010. Francesca specializes in interior and domestic space in French modernist art, visual culture and design, particularly with a feminist perspective, and has published many articles in this field. Uh, fairly recently, she was the curator of the Barber Institute of Fine Arts exhibition, Maman, Vuillard and Madame Vuillard, and co-author of its catalog. And I recommend it highly. I've got my copy right here. And you can also find it on Amazon and our museum gift shop. Francesca is, uh, has not remained idle. She is busy on another publication that we are all eager to see. Um, and she is expecting to publish in early 2023, a book entitled Edward Vuillard and the Nabi, Art and the Politics of Domesticity. Welcome Francesca, and thank you for joining us this afternoon in Portland and very late in the evening in Birmingham. Um, we should all give Francesca extra credit. I believe it is now 10 p.m. in England. And so uh, we welcome her with warm hearts and we hope that she has a good cup of coffee to keep her going. I will turn off my video now and hand it over to Francesca, but I'll see you again for questions and answers at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. Hello. Thank you so much, Mary, for introducing me. Um, and also for inviting me uh, uh, to talk to your audience. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not uh, in Portland and not able to see your fantastic exhibition, um, but I'm very pleased to be here um, this afternoon for, for many of you and uh, tonight for me um, and a few others. Okay, just to describe myself. Um, so I am a white woman, um, middle-aged white woman, um, and I have uh, straight uh, brown hair uh, cut in a bob, and I have what I think in America you call bangs, which we call here fringe. Um, and I have uh, blue glasses. I'm wearing a black and white blouse and a black blazer. And I'm speaking to you from my spare room stroke study in my house. Um, and therefore behind me, I have a bed, um, which may not seem all that professional, but in a way it kind of rather fits the theme of the exhibition and also perhaps my talk. So I feel okay with that. Okay, um, in order to get started, let me uh, begin by sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm hoping you can all that everyone can can see this and see my title page. Um, uh, the the subject of my uh, lecture is living together, working together, 
Edouard Fouillard and his mother. Okay, um, so to date, the identity accrued by Madame Fouillard through interpretation, uh, sorry, accrued by Madame Marie Fouillard through interpretation of her son's art has predominantly been that of the selflessly devoted mother. Inspired perhaps by Fouillard's reported statement of 1920 to his biographer, Jacques Salomon, that maman, as in mummy, is my muse, an overarching narrative of maternal self-sacrifice still lingers, possibly to the detriment of further, more thorough inquiry. Undoubtedly, Madame Fouillard was devoted to her son, just as Fouillard was devoted to his mother. More than 500 paintings in which she is depicted, plus countless works on paper, from semi-automatic sketch to compositional design, lithograph, pastel, and amateur photograph, made over a period of four decades, a surely testament to this. As is the fact that Fouillard and his mother cohabited until her death in 1928 at the age of 89 when her son found himself living alone for the first time at, shall we say, the tender age of 61. Moreover, frequent entries in the artist's private journal signal the profound feelings and memories of feelings of both pleasure and loss that were stimulated when Vuillard contemplated after her death the small photographs he had taken of his mother. While acknowledging the profundity of their love and its modes of expression, this lecture transcends the abstract concepts of maternal devotion and artistic muse in order to foreground the substance of Madame Vuillard's role in the practical undertaking of her son's art. Of course, we are familiar with women as models, muses and patrons, but what also of women as artistic collaborators by other more prosaic means, including as technicians, financiers, carers, and emotional and physical laborers in the service of the production of art for which they are not the artist. The mutuality of the Vuillard's working and living practices, their living and working together and alongside one another, as understood through the lens of a social history attentive to feminine experience, will emerge as a central theme of my lecture. Indeed, this mutuality is directly addressed by the artist himself in a stunning single color lithograph made in 1895 a proof of which is seen tacked to the wall of Wyard's studio in a photograph taken around 1909, suggesting he had made an image of lasting personal and professional significance. The title L'Atelier, as in the studio, holds the potential to signify either the seamstress's workshop or the artist's studio as the subject of a representation in which the working practices of each site are merged. The shorter, frontal facing figures of Madame Vuillard and Vuillard's older sister, Marie Roussel, each identifiable in lamplight by typical deportment and facial similarity, attend to two elegant women, probably clients, as they are seen dress trying on dresses. But the nature of the space itself remains deliciously ambiguous, combining a lamp on a chest or work table at left. Um, with the distinct silhouette of an artist easel to the right. Marie's body overlays the structure of the easel at the site of a painting, pushing the visual narrative of mutuality just that little bit further. As will be seen, an outcome of Vuillard and Madame Vuillard's reciprocity is the many artworks for which the artist's mother was model and motif. For all their technical and formal economy, their Nabi synthetism, one glimpses in Fouillard's interiors the diverse domestic roles and responsibilities of an aging petit bourgeois widow at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. The figure of Madame Fouillard is present as seamstress and patron, as in owner, of a family sewing business, the imparter of matriarchal advice and giver of maternal care to her daughter, 
at her toilette, reading the paper, resting after dinner, or even sleeping in bed, and as the apartment's cook and cleaner. The diversity alone of these roles and activities situated entirely within the confines of domestic space suggests it is erroneous to assume Vuillard's output to be artistically and socially conservative, or even just sentimental and predictable, simply because it is the artist's aging mother that is their motif. In certain works, undoubtedly the plump maternal body dissolves into and helps create an enveloping interior space that might offer compensatory fulfillment to the nostalgic imagination, and I've argued this elsewhere. Nonetheless, about these paintings, for example. Nonetheless, Vuillard and Madame Vuillard also brought petit bourgeois feminine domesticity into visibility as a complex alternative motif in the masculinist spaces of the Parisian avant-garde. Indeed, themes of illness, sex, aging and death, together with those of leisure, humor, care, and women's domestic and professional work in the home are integral to Vuillard's version of feminine domesticity. At the same time, Vuillard's devotion to his mother and painterly attention to women's experience of domestic life has jarred with stereotypes of masculinity, of which the cliche of the avant-garde male artist as heterosexual outlaw is just one symptom. There is a long history of inferred effeminacy in the critical and artist, art historical construction of We Are, quite incorrectly, as acutely sensitive, rather reclusive, and even repressed. It is as though a son's commitment to and reliance upon his widowed mother and prolonged professional interest in women's everyday experience lies outside the terrain of normative masculinity. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about some of um, the sort of practicalities of her input into Weir's uh, practice. So thinking about her as a kind of advisor, a financier and a technician. Vuillard's journals provide ample evidence that the artist sought his mother's counsel and crucially agreement in respect of significant career decisions. This impression, sorry, the impression given by Vuillard's short notations is one of careful negotiation, not least because Madame Vuillard's ambitions for her son entailed the professional as opposed to vanguard markers of success a pretty bourgeois mother might expect. In 1907, for example, he discussed with his mother, and he tells this in the journal, he discussed with his mother the artistic compromises, um, things like producing and exhibiting a certain number of works per year, accepting commissions as well. And he also discussed the financial rewards, a salary, of his not entirely satisfactory contractual arrangements with Gallery Bernheim Jeune. Given their cohabitation and the certainty that it was Madame Vuillard that provided dependable, if not substantial, income to the Vuillard household during the first decade of his career, one can imagine her motivations were more complex than those conceptualized simply by maternal pride. Vuillard's journals and correspondence between mother and son indicate that Together, they faced persistent money worries, particularly before he signed to Bernheim Jeune. The Vuillard family were pretty bourgeois and not well off. Vuillard was the youngest of three children, and there they are, lined up for you, uh, born 1868 to Honoré, and there's a drawing of Honoré um, on the left, and Marie Vuillard. Honoré was a tax collector and former naval captain who had been retired out of the milita military in 1854, following serious injury during active service, and for which he was awarded the, the Légion d'Honneur. Following the Vuillard's relocation from Burgundy to Paris on Honoré's retirement from tax collecting in 1877, and as the child of a decorated father, Vuillard and his siblings, Marie and Alexandre, were able to study at leading secondary state schools. Vuillard as a day pupil on a state scholarship at the prestigious Lycée Condorcet. 
In Paris, it was Madame Vuillard's work that supported the family. In 1878, she followed in her seamstress mother's footsteps with the acquisition of a small, domestically located central Parisian sewing business, doing so some six years before her husband's death in 1884, when Vuillard was 15. Vuillard's single sex schooling between 1879 and 85 and subsequent artistic training at the independent Académie Julien and briefly the École des Beaux-Arts were to pro prove hugely significant in his development. It was in these institutions that he developed a lasting network of male friends who would go on to become avant-garde and then leading cultural producers as artists, writers, musicians and theatre directors, and who in the main had grown up in bourgeois families marked by greater financial independence than the petit bourgeois industriousness of his own. It's being slow. Hang on. There we go. In late 1899, Vuillard was introduced by his school friend Maurice Denis to a self styled group of Academie Julien students, the Nabis. These artists united in reaction to the illusionistic modeling demanded by the academic training system, but each took individual routes away from naturalism towards what Paul Gauguin had recently labeled synthetism. This was a decorative style which fused form, motif and meaning, achieving its visual effects by the application of broad areas of non-naturalistic colour and a disinclination to model volume and space in light and shade. Through synthetism, the Nabis aimed to achieve visual expression of individual emotions and memories as stimulated by the observable world. So I'm just showing you these two to, to compare them. Hopefully you can see um, some quite obvious similarities uh, between these two paintings, the Gauguin and the, an early Vuillard. Unsurprisingly, Vuillard and his mother sought each other's opinion when looking to relocate together to a new rented apartment in central or northwestern Paris, which they did frequently. In each modest apartment, Vuillard installed a studio in his bedroom, an atelier chambre, as a place in which to sleep, but also to make works on paper and small easel paintings. Similarly, Madame Vuillard fashioned spaces, usually centred on the dining room, in which to direct with her mother Désirée and daughter Marie among the employees, her made to measure corsetry and dressmaking business. It was most likely a supply of cardboard box offcuts, either gleaned or gifted from the dining room sewing atelier, that would function in Vuillard's painterly practice as a cheaper and more experimental alternative to a canvas support. Beyond the supply of some painting materials, fragmentary evidence exists to suggest that Madame Vuillard provided diverse forms of technical support to her son's creative practices. Here, Vuillard's mother comes into view as an informal technical assistant by virtue of her capacity for domesticity. Her technical support includes, together with Vuillard's sister, sewing in connection with the staging of Nabi puppet shows, and potentially also sewing in support of his work from 1893 as the artistic director of the avant-garde Théâtre de l'Oeuvre, the, the theatre of the work. The responsibilities of which included the design and manufacture of programmes, costumes and stage sets. Also, Madame Vuillard was the printer of hundreds of photographs taken by Vuillard following his acquisition sometime around 1898 of a handheld, at chest height that is, Kodak box camera. For many of these snapshots, she had also been the sitter, even most likely his first sitter. Printing these photographs at home on Eastman solio paper would have entailed contact printing the negative by a window, 
washing the print in frequently changed water, fixing and then laying each print out to dry on lint-free cloth. This was a process requiring patience, attentiveness, and according to a contemporary Kodak user manual, clean hands, clean dishes, and clean cloths. In the print shown here, taken between 1899 and 1904 in their Rue Truffaut apartment, light acts to bifurcate the figure of Madame Vuillard, varying enough to dematerialize, flatten, or add texture to her appearance. Indeed, vertical juxtapositions of dark and light ripple across the surface of the print from the immediate foreground wall at left to paintbrushes tidily arranged in a pot behind the window frame at right. With the sight of the silhouetted paintbrushes comes the realization that Madame Vuillard has been photographed by her son in the process of cleaning his home studio. One can see therefore that Madame Vuillard provided to her son from a young age, a model of how one successfully works and makes at home. In these apartments, Madame Vuillard further supported her son's practice by means of countless domestic tasks associated with housework that she, together with Vuillard's grandmother and sister, carried out on a daily basis. Unusually for a young male artist with avant-gardist ambitions, it was this domestic labor and the professional female work of the sewing atelier that formed the motifs at the core of Wiard's earliest Nabi artworks, including those he exhibited regularly at the Le Bac de Boutville gallery after 1891, I'm showing you two of those here, and which critics soon came to identify as the work of an antimiste or intimist. The influential leftist critic, Gustave Geoffroy, claimed the eight works we are exhibited November 1892 at Le Barc, these, sorry, quote, these audacious but summary conjugations of color and line, affirmed we are as an intimist with a delicious sense of humor, knowing how to mix the melancholic and the comic, dosing them with a light hand and conjuring up a sparkle of color a magical start of light in heavily shadowed interiors." End quote. Thus, Geoffroy found ambiguity, irony, melancholy and humor in Vuillard's art, and thereby produced a modernist identity for antimism. More generally, it was the intimacy, sometimes serious or witty, often banal, of their motifs, their shallow, simplified compositional structure, worked over with dense um, composites of pattern or matte patches of pigment, the omission of spaces between figures and things, and the intimate viewing conditions these very small works required of their viewers that caught the attention of Wyard's earliest critics. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to talk about um, Madame Wyard as a seamstress and owner of her own business. Um, the sewing business. Here, we might pause to register the domestic studio's capacity to enable Vuillard to immerse himself via the perceptualism of the observational sketch and the conceptualism of the antimist painting in the quotidian domesticity of Madame Vuillard. The so-called Cahier Saint Honoré, or, or sort of sketchbook Saint Honoré, dating to late 1894, is filled with linear pen and ink drawings, usually several to a page, summarily but repeatedly depicting the furniture and rooms of the apartment and the habitual activities, postures, and gestures of its inhabitants. Among sketches of Marie, her husband, Ker Xavier Roussel, and others, the figure of Madame Vuillard dominates. In addition to many versions of her head and torso, we find also individual drawings of her hand holding a book or pulling a thread, as well as isolated studies of her ear, her parted hair, and the tips of her thumb and forefinger clasping an unseen needle. Evidence of we are seeing his mother's domesticity, 
and I do emphasize seeing there, he chose to see her domesticity, in other words, evidence of we are seeing um, his mother's domesticity, particularly her professional labor, predates even the 1890 installation of his first domestic studio in the attic at 10 Rue de Miromesnil, suggesting the atelier chambre were installed with the express purpose of materializing a pre-existing artistic intent. Two thirds of the 12th page of the first of, journal, of Wiard's journal notebooks is typically crammed with diminutive sketches of which seven vignettes can be determined. The lower third incidentally features four outline sketches of paintings that include a still life and notably, here it is, Johannes Vermeer's The Lace Maker, um, a painting of 1669 to 70. Vuillard was a regular, even daily visitor to the Louvre and for most of the 1890s lived just one street away from the museum on Rue Saint-Honoré. Among the sketches above, so on the top sort of two thirds of the page, um, it is possible to detect three scenes focused on seamstresses bent over dining tables. Light imaginatively cast from each of the table's lamps either dissolves the elliptical, elliptical table surface and the figures seated behind it or throws other figures into hatched relief. It is the professional labor of women in domestic rooms that Vuia had seen and quickly modeled in light and shade over the course of an evening in November, 1888. I realize I've mislabeled that as 1890, I'm sorry, it's 1888. This was a motif that he continued to choose to see, sketch and paint repeatedly. But it was also an activity made available to his vision by virtue of being the son of the patron of a family sewing atelier who was willing to pose for and more commonly to be continuously observed and sketched by her son. It's just buffering again. I'll go back. It seems to be that painting dressmakers that's causing some trouble anyway. Uh, interestingly, however, paintings of seamstresses at work tables only began to materialize in his painted output two years later in 1890. In September 1890, we are claimed to have built up enough sketches to form the basis of ideas for many years worth of working in paint. But prior to this, he had already forced a distinction between drawn observation and painterly execution between the formerly innovative art practiced in the Atelier Chambre and the semi-automatic observational sketching conducted in the apartment at large. When in 1889, he gave up painting directly in front of the model in order to start painting from memory. We are sewing atelier paintings constitute a coherent body of work plugged directly and, in my opinion, deliberately into lively contemporary debates about the politics of domesticity and the working woman. These include issues of industrial homeworking, family workshops, female syndicalism, and the visibility of the work and body of the seamstress. In the 1890s, the seamstress's body was at the center of state employment legislation to restrict women's working hours. Sociological travail at domicile or homeworking surveys, feminist campaigns against sex selective laws and popular and elite illustrated literature. The latter includes Queens of the Needle, an expensive fictionalized study of the working habits of the Parisian seamstress published in 1902 by art critic and writer Arsène Alexandre. Interestingly, he was one of Wiard's earliest patrons and the then owner of two of the artist's 1890s sewing paintings, including The Length of Thread, in which the figure of Madame Wiard is just discernible at left, just here, um, as one of three seamstresses at a narrow work table. Criticizing the miserablest findings of sociological employment studies, Alexandra claimed that only an artist was capable of really seeing these 
quote, modern life beauties. Indeed, poetic passages describing sewing ateliers in terms of, quote, a harmonious mix of silhouettes, an opposition of tones, a symphony of movements, may directly owe their rhetoric to his observation of the length of thread. But while Alexandra invited his readers to linger over the many detailed descriptions of the seamstress's physical appearance, the dematerializing figures of Wayard's painting enact characteristic postures and deflecting gestures. The inquisitive eye is drawn instead towards the startling colors of the interior's material culture, the sewing fabrics included. Indeed, it is via these techniques that we are implemented and essentialized as opposed to illusorily naturalistic pictorial language that was nonetheless capable of encapsulating in many paintings some of the nuances of this working life, if not its worst privations and exploitations. This includes signs of non-hierarchical teamwork and feminine intergenerationality, but also long evening work in paintings featuring a mature seamstress, youthful employees, and very young apprentices. And these young apprentices may have been working illegally, maybe not, we'll, we'll see, <laughs> maybe, um, because um, it became illegal for women or girls, I should say, under 18 to, to work um, uh, night work um, from January 1893 because of a new law. And just to add one thing, um, although the title of this wonderful painting that's in the um, Scottish National Galleries um, is Two Seamstresses in the Workroom, um, we are actually exhibited it in 1893 as little girls on a blue orange background. Actually, I believe there are three figures in this painting and that this is Madame Fouillard here, um, almost obliterated by a box. The figure of Madame Fouillard is a marginal yet recognizable presence in each of these paintings. Her patron's authority, more usually staged in atelier paintings presenting mother and daughter alone. In others, her figure is the focus for the painterly delineation of a figural and, and, and temporal ebb and flow typical of industrial homeworking. In the two tables of 1894, Vuillard shows how women who worked in the home negotiated the functional boundaries of that space. Contrary to the prevailing bourgeois prescription, yet true to contemporary pretty bourgeois use, Vuillard in this painting and Madame Vuillard in her own practice de-specialized domestic space. Here, the family dining room doubles as the professional workroom. The circular dining table just down here, and um, its corresponding straight back chairs are pushed to the foreground margins, leaving the lamp suspended over empty space, to the extent that space can ever be considered empty in a painting by Fouillard. Redundant in its present location, the lamp constitutes a telling if subtle signifier of the room's proper domestic function. On a long work table at the rear, are a variety of different materials, one of which issues forth in a crumpled heap from the complicated form of a covered sewing machine at left. At the opposite end of the table, the familiar figure of Madame Fouillard, clothed in a pale blue and brown dress and red scarf, is absorbed in her work, as yet unaware of the dark figure entering from the kitchen stage left. In further sewing images, including the length of thread and a lithograph, the dressmaker, we see the same cropped foreground dining chair, visual shorthand for a multifunctional and cooperative use of space. In contrast to the lone seamstress's body on the street and in the factory, the small family workshop remained a private matter legislatively closed off to the French government's new inspection system and lacking interest for the writer's prurient gaze. 
But the willingness of Madame Vuillard and seemingly her employees to accommodate Vuillard's persistent observation of the sewing atelier resulted in a body of painted work that is unique among modernists and other contemporaries in its capacity to give sustained visibility, albeit aestheticized, to the professional sewing work routinely conducted by thousands of women in Parisian homes. A 1901 statistical survey calculated that nearly 1.5 million people, or 7.5% of the French labor force, were employed in the sewing industry, with 300,000 of these working in Paris. The two Vuillard apartments at 346 and 342 Rue Saint-Honoré that between 1891 and 97 were the site for the making of an artistic corpus amounting to 50 seamstress paintings were located at the centre of Paris's garment industry. Indeed, the Needle Syndicate, a professional association of needlework employers and employees occupied office space from, eight, from 1892 on the ground floor of number 342. And in domestic rooms and apartments across Paris, countless numbers of women were occupied in industrial homework, a sector of the sewing industry that expanded significantly following the passing of the November 1892 law to restrict women's factory hours. Not all home working seamstresses produced made to measure garments for local women in the type of artisanal family atelier owned by Madame Fouillard. Many engaged in contracted out labor on piecework rates and supplementary work illegally taken home from the factory at the end of an 11 hour shift. But all negotiated the economic necessity and ideological ambiguity of homework and housework in ways that remained largely immaterial to visual representation, except, that is, in the art of we are. The working woman is a motif otherwise unseen in the painterly output of other Nabi artists. Despite their dominant will to represent the, feminine, the femininity closest to hand, Personal domestic arrangements are to the fore of the 1890s interiors paintings of Pierre Bonnard, including Intimacy, which depicts the artist's sister, André Terrasse, and her husband, Claude. Typically, the painting's title does not identify the figures as portrait subjects, preferring instead symbolist evocation of physical and emotional states of intimacy that are, are a result of domestic leisure of time whiled away, chatting and smoking. Marthe Denis equally featured as an unidentified subject of many of her husband's maternity and feminine lifestyle paintings, like, sorry, not life cycle paintings, feminine life cycle paintings, including the 1895 Mother in a Black Bodice, shown in Paris that year at Le Bac de Boutville. More often than not, these are breastfeeding paintings in which the female body is made the object of an indirectly ecclesiastical or clerical discourse about sanctified maternity. It is my argument that with the active input of his mother, we are attempted a more profound engagement with the personal, social and material conditions of feminine domesticity than any of his Nabi peers. Okay, moving on now from, from work uh, to Madame Fouillard um, as a carer, and particularly in bedrooms. Moreover, when one, consider, when one turns to consider Fouillard's numerous bedroom paintings, including works such as The Chat, imagining a conversation about sex and procreation purportedly given by his mother to his sister on the morning of her wedding to Roussel, or in his close at hand approach to Marie's pregnancy sickbed and Grande Mère Michaud's curtained off deathbed, it becomes clear that if we are punctured the romanticized female life cycle narratives that dominated medical discourse and the paintings of other nubbies. 
These include decorative panels by Roussel and Denis, such as the latter's 1895 Now Lost, Woman's Love and Life, a suite of decorations for a private bedroom, a visual lesson across seven panels of a married woman's procreative duty. The chat is fascinating, not only for the sombre tonal harmonies it brings to a conversation already fraught with social and personal angst, but also for the imagined presence the male artist claims to have at this most intimate of conversations between his mother and her daughter. Almost certainly it was a conversation we are imagined rather than observed, but in doing so he resisted the prevailing tendency to mythologize even as he submitted to the theatrical art director's inclination to dramatize and even to shame. And what I mean by that is that um, what we have here is Marie in her wedding dress with a corsage um, on her bodice. Um, and despite the kind of actually quite sort of overexposed lighting of the scene, which we can certainly see here with the um, figure of Madame Vuillard and the way it, what it does um, to her face and, and also to the side of Marie's um, face, her sort of neck and her cheek, the rest of her is sort of cast into, sh into shadow. Um, uh, so she looks, you know, sort of is, is sort of perhaps an element of shame to this. And then we have this um, wonderful sort of characterization of Madame Fouillard looking extremely pleased with herself, um, with a smile, looking, should we say smug, um, with her arms like that, like, um, job done. <laughs> I've told my daughter um, uh, a very small amount that I feel that she needs to know about uh, uh, the proceedings as they go forward, shall we say. Of course, actual Parisian apartment living meant, meant co cohabitants were much more knowing about each other's private selves than deeply gendered bourgeois codes of appropriate domestic behavior prescribed. Into the first decade of the 20th century at least, the apartments in which the Vuillards lived together, or lived in together, were extremely small. Rooms were multifunctional and sometimes partitioned by curtains. In the absence of corridors, rooms were adjoined and inhabitants would need to walk through one room in order to gain access to another. Intimacy was a condition of apartment living that we are pursued in the portrayal of his mother's, sis mother's sister's and grandmother's bedrooms, even as contemporary codes of spatial arrangement assigning bedrooms to the categories of the private, the corporeal and the feminine warned against doing so. Unless that is, one was among the many contemporary artists looking only to display the thinly veiled sexuality of the young woman's body. Centered exclusively on feminine experience, Vuillard's painted bedrooms are more sites of daily ritual, perfunctory sleep and prosaic illness than aestheticized eroticism. Moreover, they are sites of practical care given by women and between women Madame Vuillard in particular. Yeah. The Calle saint Honoré's many bedroom sketches made during the period in late 1894 when the heavily pregnant Marie Roussel became dangerously ill and eventually gave birth sadly to a stillborn child indicate that several members of the family including the artist himself, took on responsibility together for her care by exchanging places at a bedside vigil. One of these sketches is made by Vuillard from the viewing position of a bedside chair and is located on the sketchbook page above, above a typically diminutive compositional design for a painting on the same theme. But now the scene is conceptualized frontally and flatly and at one remove. And when it came to turning the compositional design for the lullaby into the painting itself, Vuillard inserted the seated figure of Madame Vuillard. Here she sits as a soother with a lullaby, the title suggests, but also as a woman of, of a mature profile outlined in black, sing, signaling authoritative experience and steely determination. Maturity comes to the fore again in one further bedroom painting, The Sleep of Madame Vuillard. 
dated circa 1891 to two, it belongs to a series of early paintings depicting mother and sister asleep on single beds, the sleeping body covered almost entirely by bedding and revealed for what it is, a woman sleeping, rather than a woman made erotically available by virtue of sleeping. White and off-white paint has been applied in rough, dry strokes to indicate bedding and the rear wall, while yellow is laid over brown to imply discarded clothes at lower right, a shape also from which to peer behind. Rejecting impressionist conventions for crafting textural and tonal nuance in sheets, there is a rough hewn quality to the painting's surface, the diagonal shapes of which mimic the look of paint torn off in strips more than built up in layers. Rawness equally is a property of the sleeping Madame Voyard's face, its drooping, aging features unflatteringly delineated in pink and orange. Clearly, this is a painting freed from social and artistic conventions and further testament to the fact that Vuillard's embedded working method afforded, or at least presumed to afford, the artist bedside access to everyday femininity at some of its most unguarded moments. But at what cost to individual privacy? What was it like to have one's sleeping face or experience of bereavement take permanent shape in paint? I'm going to leave that hanging um, as some questions. OK, moving on to my final um, consideration of Madame Vuillard. Well, actually, well uh, almost final. Uh, that is as domestic servant. Interestingly, Vuillard's atelier chambre, his uh, bedroom studio, achieved only limited visibility itself as a motif in the artist's painted output of the 1890s, despite attention given to subjective perception of it in the pages of his journal. It latterly came into view around 1900, under conditions by which female models reclined naked as objects of painterly study on a bed um, a folding bed in the 28 Rue Truffaut apartment. In the folding bed of 1903, a female nude reclines while staring out towards the position from which the painting is made. Amid the material culture of pretty bourgeois domesticity, we find in the skirt and chemise draped across a chair to the left, the suggestion of artistic production and erotic desire. Other than the nude figure, these are the only signs of the room's identity as a professional artist's domestic studio. The same room had been the subject of a 1900 to 1901 painting that was reworked in 1915, Madame Vuillard filling a carafe. Dressed informally in a house coat, Vuillard's mother is portrayed working in at least two guises to facilitate her son's artistic practice. As artist model, demonstrably posing a la Vermeer, and as housewife delivering water to the bedroom that doubles as a studio. Here the bed stands empty and unkempt, waiting either for a body to fill it or for a woman, probably this woman, to make it. One cannot help but ask, is it for her son or for one of his models that Madame Vuillard fills that carafe? The performative gestures of this and other post-1900 housework paintings, including the much later Madame Vuillard lighting a Myra stove, suggest that having retired from the sewing business in 1898, Madame Vuillard made herself available and continued to keep herself in the picture, even in old age. As the domestic servant, has, uh, as the domestic servant to her son's domestic painting practice. A more conventionally naturalist painting than previously seen, it was produced over several months in 1924. Here we might be surprised to find a frail woman in her mid 80s kneeling on all fours to light a stove in the studio salon. Madame Vuillard is still working hard as model and housewife to facilitate her son's artistic practice, though a preparatory photograph more clearly bears the bodily traces the sheer physical difficulty, even pain, of fulfilling these roles. The weight-bearing hand and wrist are too lightly articulated in the painting to be wholly convincing. 
Nonetheless, the cropped orientation towards the elderly figure of two empty chairs serves as an invitation to contemplate the difficult physical performance that is the elderly woman's domestic labor. The artist has juxtaposed an imposing plaster bust of the youthful Venus de Milo with the, his portrayal of frail but stoically domesticated femininity, itself made the object of the statue's contemplation. In advice literature, at least, housework was and continued to be a young woman's game. Older women had a significant role to play in contemporaneous domestic economy manuals as advisors to the physical work of their fictional young students, the voice of authority, but not the worker herself. But housework is not work that can be retired from, as Madame Voyard seems at pains to demonstrate. Together, Voyard and Madame Voyard have brought into visibility as an artistic motif what was known but not seen, the productive physical housework of an aging pretty bourgeois woman. But is Voyard somewhat, somehow in the picture too? Does, his, does this housework painting confront the actual personal conditions of his domestic life and working relations with his mother? The solitary vacant easel operates here as a convenient but appropriate visual metaphor for the absent male artist who was also a son. For all that the housework images make Madame Vuillard's domestic labor visible in ways that are modern and often modernist, they also work hard to establish that housework is, without question, women's work. Financially, spatially, physically, and in a variety of other ways that are imperceptible through the vicissitudes of history, Vuillard's practice and artworks were, in part, enabled by his widowed mother's labor. Undoubtedly, the pretty bourgeois and Catholic, and Catholic values of hard work and in indeed maternal devotion in the context of widowhood underpinned the material support Madame Vuillard gave her son. But more fundamentally, she showed him a way of living and of working and of making together and alongside one another, the outcomes of which should be considered more remarkable than they usually are. In Vuillard's small yet absorbing artworks, we find a diversity of femininity and feminine experience in domesticity, complex and intimate relationships of care and authority between women, and multiple modes of women's immaterial labor made visible. It was also by this means that Madame Vuillard got herself in the picture many times over, a process by which the aging yet productive female body becomes, became visible in and to modernist practice. Hence, a woman whose unremarkable life did not otherwise merit historical record keeping has emerged via modern art as a compelling object of historical analysis. Oh, final slide. Finally, as viewer. As, as has already become clear, there is a good deal of feminine agency to be found in Voyard's practice and in his artworks. With the active input of his mother and the other women of the household, Voyard attempted a prolonged engagement with the personal, social, and material conditions of feminine domesticity. Moreover, Madame Vuillard, her mother Desiree, and daughter Marie all lived with Vuillard's art, both during the process of its making and once it was finished. See, for example, the small paintings on the wall in After the Meal. Inevitably, they were the first audience for the works made in the studio bedroom and the most sustained audience for the paintings that remained in the Vuillard personal collection that hung on their apartment walls. Thus, we are produced art in collaboration, not only with women as models, technicians, financiers, houseworkers, and so on, but also in the knowledge that what he produced would be subject to their spectatorship. Indeed, this would be the spectatorship of the very same women whose habitual gestures, working habits, and personal lives we are used as the basis of his output. One might even go so far as to suggest that the anti-mist artworks were made with a female audience in mind. 
So might it be to this particularly elusive mode of feminine agency, the dominant female gaze, that one can attribute, at least in part, something of the profundity of Wyard's engagement with feminine experience? Thank you. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Francesca. And I'm going to join you on the screen now. Um, that was just a marvelous talk. I've got pages of notes here. And um, I'm wondering if I can start off our questions. Um, I will invite our viewers to um, uh, type their questions into the Q&A. I see some popping up now, but uh, I'm going to be greedy and, and pose the first question, if I may. I was really struck by um, how you talked about Riyard's capacity to give visibility to the labor around him and how that he made a deliberate choice to see these things. Uh, so often, even going through galleries, we choose to see images as relaxation or just normal domesticity, but really he chose them to see them as labor. Do you have any theories about what kind of predisposed him to that? Or do you think he, he really made a conscious choice to, to bring up uh, labor as part of his pictorial practice? Um, uh, I think there's a, a range of ways of trying to understand that. I mean, um, I, mean I think he was obviously surrounded by labor um, all of the time because of his mother's work um, and because she was pretty bourgeois. Um, whereas, as I sort of said, um, you know, a lot of his friends um, who he'd made at this rather exclusive state uh, school, the Lycée Condorcet, were uh, rather more bourgeois than he was and therefore had more servants in the house, etc., cetera, um, and would be perhaps married to uh, or become married to women um, who didn't necessarily engage in quite so much domestic labor as his mother, his sister, et cetera. So I think he was surrounded by labor because of his class. Um, I think also that um, there's an element of sort of politics to it with him, which I haven't, I don't have, hadn't had time to talk about really here, um, but certainly in the early 1890s and, and actually through the 1890s, because there's evidence um, later in the 1890s, he was sympathetic to um, uh, anarcho-communism. Um, and that get, tends to get a bit kind of um, sort of brushed under the carpet, I think, in, in Nabi's studies. I mean, we know that Valaton was really very committed to that. We know that Husserl was a communist, um, <laughs> certainly, um, and that Bonnard also had sympathies, of, similar to, to we are. I wouldn't say that they, you know, deeply read on anarcho-communism, et cetera, but they certainly were sympathetic and they, they had friends who were um, very sort of committed to it, shall we say. And I think um, there is a, certainly a kind of politics of labor in anarcho-communism, politics particularly of artisanal labor. And I think that might be one reason why he was very interested in um, the artisanal sewing atelier of his mother. Um, so I think that's one reason. And then I was, I was just sort of starting, I suppose, to hint at, and I haven't, I mean, I'm sort of thinking about this for my book, but uh, um, it needs more thinking about by me. But I, I have really sort of, I suppose, more latterly started to want to think about um, Madame Vuillard and Marie Roussel, his sister, and until she, she died in, in early 1893, his grandmother, as, you know, viewers of his work, as an audience for his work. Um, we often think about the audience being, you know, those that would go to the Le Bac de Boutville and other little exhibitions, um, these sort of avant-garde spaces, um, which we tend to think of as being a sort of, should we say, a male audience or, or kind of, you know, the idea of the dominant male gaze as well being perhaps prevalent there. Um, but actually, um, if you think about it, they would have been some of the first and most thorough viewers of his work. And I, I really sort of Think that that's a useful way to actually perhaps think about um, uh, why maybe he was so interested in in portraying labor but also just interested in more generally in really trying to convey something of, of a woman's experience of domesticity. Um, well that's a marvelous yeah. angle of investigation and it's interesting too I hope you'll uh, investigate which objects stayed inside the family collection um, and which were, were sold. I, I have a hazy idea of some that stayed with his mother or his sister for a, a very long time. Um, ah. 
Maybe. Well, I might have to. I might have to email you after that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't got to the stage of thinking about it quite. In this no, way. one book at a time. One book <laughs> at a time. I was also really um, struck by the fact that, as you mentioned in the talk, that uh, Riard gives visibility to um, Marie's troubled pregnancy, and then uh, we don't see her much in your talk, but throughout the exhibition, we see image after image of young Annette, the first surviving child of his daughter, of his sister. And um, I'm just wondering if you feel like, was that seen as amongst the critics as a little strange for an artist to be so interested in the life of an infant or for Annette to appear again and again, or was that sort of just under the umbrella of family life? Um, I see, I, I'm very touched by their relationship and mm -hmm. I, I see a great deal of meaning there. And I'm wondering if it struck others as, you know, just part of what an artist does or something out of the ordinary. That's a really good question, Mary. I haven't come across any critical response that actually engages, I suppose, specifically with any of the paintings of Annette. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not something I've come across that, that level of discussion. And in fact, the, the critical response, um, I mean, Geoffroy, I think, is excellent and, and, a, and a few others, but actually quite a lot of the critical response tends to just go off into these sort of um, romantic kind of reveries about, about, you know, femininity and the interior and the sort of, you know, the sort of dutiful wife who, who sews and, and reads is it sort of, you know, one of the one of the kind of comments by a critic. Um, they tend to actually not really look at the paintings and certainly not see all the labor um, and the work. So, so actually the critical response of the period anyway is, is, is um, it's good in terms of sort of modernism, shall we say, and, and sort of recognizing that, but actually in really, really, I think looking at Fouillard's art, um, uh, perhaps not so good. And actually that's particularly true, and I'm slightly um, going off um, away from Annette here, but um, that's certainly true of, of Alexandre, who, who wrote that book, The Queens of the Needle, who had, you know, two of, uh, well, six Fouillard Antimist works in his collection. Um, and, uh, you know, two of which were these seamstress paintings. And yet he produces this terribly cliched book, The Queens of the Needle, in which he certainly borrows um, some of the aesthetics of Weir, because he talks about the sort of silhouette and symphony, and he goes into this sort of synthetist, um, artist, critical language, shall we say. Um, but, um, doesn't really see that this is you know about sort of women's work and and um productivity um or and skilled labor and it's all just about how gorgeous or not various seamstresses uh, are that he follows on the streets of paris um back to annette um i'm not sure i really have an answer in terms of, of the kind of critics you you might actually in your research for the exhibition have found out more more than i have about um, I mean, I'm certainly fascinated by the tenderness of it and, the, you know, the, that painting particularly that um, features Annette and her father, Roussel, uh, <laughs> uh, where Roussel seems, you know, very distant and, and rather sort of um, unattached uh, to his daughter, whereas there's this sort of rather tenderness in the way that Annette looks out of the painting towards her uncle who's painting her portrait. Um, well, I was looking at that painting just before your talk, Francesca, so that was high on my mind. Uh, but I'm going to shift gears here a little bit and answer, um, pose some of the questions that our viewers have asked about. And this first one, you are exactly the right woman to ask because of your great experience with the French 19th century interior, not just with Fouillard. And one of our uh, viewers asked that uh, in the exhibition, she noticed the similarity in the color palette of many of the paintings and prints. There's burgundy and rusty red and deep greens and peaches and pinks. And she was wondering if these colors were fashionable at the time or if they were used for some other reason. Were these colors that we would see in a typical 19th century bourgeois or petit bourgeois interior? I think the burgundies and the greens, I would say yes. <laughs> um, I, I, peaches, I, you know, I, I'm not so sure, but certainly, um, uh, you know, you have these um, really heavy wallpapers, everything kind of um, very patterned, everything highly textured, lots of um, velvet and tassels and um, clash, just clash, should we call it. and and. Um, one thing, one of the things I love about Fouillard's work, I mean, sometimes you get these rather 
sort of beautiful patterns and it's all kind of quite well sort of contained, shall we say, and a painting like The Length of Thread, I think is an example of that, where he just does it in some verticals and then you have this kind of flurry of the fabrics. But in other paintings, the one I finished with actually, after the meal, is this kind of, you know, crazy mix of greens and, and yellows and, and reds and, and clashing patterns um, that he makes a real sort of feature of the sort of unattractiveness of it actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so he, he does pattern you know, differently. Sometimes it's rather sort of a, attractive use of pattern and other times he's deliberately being ugly. Um, but certainly to answer that question, um, heavy colors, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in a pretty bourgeois apartments that they rented, for example, you know, which, as I said, were, you know, very small rooms, all tightly contained, very few corridors. And I've seen some of the floor plans of some of them um, uh, with these intensely patterned sort of fabrics um, and wallpapers, etc. It would have been really quite overwhelming. <laughs> Almost perfectly answered a question that just came in. Um, our viewer asks about the um, hot chocolate painting. And he writes, um, in the pattern of wallpaper, tablecloth, and clothing, do you know if this kind of riot of pattern was done to enhance the painting, or were those real life patterns that you would have seen at the time? I think he, he um, very good question. He, um, he and he enhanced certainly so so it's a it's a basically a painting about brown <laughs> <laughs> um really um and um i mean we don't have you know his wallpapers we the, all of that you know was was they they just rented apartments and they moved on so they had to live with the wallpaper um absolutely that they were given um and none of that you know none of it survives in that way so we can't say too much about um him there are photographs but color obviously does doesn't, doesn't uh, operate in those. Um, but it's a painting where he is deliberately, um, again, sort of, as I was sort of saying before, um, made it deliberately ugly. And that, that is, you know, something that, that he, other ones, as I said, that they're, they're rather beautiful, um, but there are paintings, particularly um, actually at that 1892 show, um, which, you know, he is de being deliberately ugly. So this kind of exercise in, in brown, um, mm -hmm. and then you have their expressions, which are just sort of these mask-like sort of faces, but they're not, um, I mean, what you what you would conventionally have in in domestic interior paintings featuring women um, at the table or at home or whatever um, would be this sort of you know um, uh, sort of not happiness but sort of contentment um, mm -hmm. and uh, you know beautifulness and a sort of woman as an aesthetic object often in the interior um, and he really doesn't do that he just makes them look incredibly sort of bored and and the, the painting. <laughs> You know, so that it's ugly and they look kind of rather bored. And um, uh, what's fascinating, furthermore, about that, um, and there is actually a, a picture of it, I think, in in my uh, little catalog, um, the Mammon catalog, is that one a, a, um, a cartoonist um, made lots of cartoons of um, that exhibition, including one um, of that painting called um, what's well, now called Hot Chocolate. He exhibited it as Le Déjeuner, the lunch. Um, and the cartoonist um, obviously picked up on the sort of um, ugliness and perhaps the kind of the fact that this was an unconventional painting of women at home, because what he did in the cartoon was he, um, he uh, popped a mop into a vase on the table, sort of, sort of like they've dumped their domesticity. They, you know, we're not doing any more housework. Um, maybe they've even failed at being good domestic women. Um, and um, then they have these, um, I'm afraid, rather than the uh, cups that they are drinking hot chocolate from in the painting, he's exchanged chamber pots um, filled with brown, with liquid. Um, and uh, the question at the bottom of the cartoon is, are you sure this is chocolate? <laughs> you know, those cartoons, um, when we're lucky enough to find them of, um, of exhibitions, tell us so much, don't they, about viewer reactions? Yeah. Yes. And, and that one's rather wonderful because as I said earlier, you know, a lot of the critics didn't necessarily, you know, they went off in these reveries about wonderful domesticity, not really, really looking at some of them, whereas actually this cartoonist really did pick up actually on that the kangaroo. It goes back to your comment about how he cho he chose to see, we are chose to see this 
and had that capacity to give visibility. Yeah, marvelous. Well, I think we'll um, we'll go to one last question before we sign off. And this takes us a little bit out of the interior and into the wider world. Um, a viewer asks about Vuillard's uh, theater sets. And he was very active in the Symbolist Theater. And she wonders um, if his style remained the same or if he had sort of a different artistic vocabulary when he was working in theater productions. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. What is What happens to Vuillard when he steps outside of these intimate interiors? Well, um, there's sort of two ways of answering that. The, the first is that we don't have the theater sets anymore, um, I'm afraid. Um, none of that, um, as far as I'm aware anyway, um, survives. I mean, this was an, an avant-garde theater. This wasn't, this wasn't boulevard theater. It was you know, um, a very kind of, um, I mean, it, an important um, uh, theatre, certainly important because they actually brought to Paris the first Ibsen and Maeterlinck um, uh, plays, etc. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, it's hard to actually say anything about the sets. Um, we do know that in some of them they ran sort of screeds or sort of um, they sort of veiled the stage um, and that the uh, actors would actually sort of um, uh, do these kind of um, sort of robotic movements and things. So they were really interested in absolutely changing the form of, of theatre and really innovating um, and rendering theatre strange. And, and we are was absolutely part of that. Um, uh, you know, as I said, that another radical thing was was the kind of bringing uh, to Paris of, of you know, feminist kind of drama in a way in the, the works of uh, the plays of someone like Ibsen. Um, uh, they also did puppetry as well, which was very important uh, to, to the Nabis, and, and those were, again, kind of quite sort of anti-bourgeois, shall we say, um, uh, quite left-wing sort of puppet shows, Ubuvoir, etc., that Bonnard particularly was involved in. Um, certainly, I think that the theatre, his work um, in theatre uh, informed um, his art his artistic output, I think, um, and I think really Guy Cogeval has probably written the, the most about this and he sort of makes dramas out of things and you, he, Cogeval, I sort of like it, maybe I don't, um, <laughs> uh, writes about that painting, The Chat, as a sort of theatrical kind of drama. Um, I'm more interested in um, just the, the strangeness of, of that moment of um, a mother um, giving this probably two minute conversation to her daughter about um, what she might expect on her wedding night um, or, or really what her, actually not what she would expect, what her duty was. Um, but um, so, so certainly there are, there is um, heightened theatricality and heightened drama that he builds into some paintings that, I mean, I think it would be wrong to assume that these are all sort of, they're not realist paintings. A lot of the stuff didn't necessarily happen. Um, you know, he theatricalizes um, things in other, in other ways. They're not. In other paintings, they're very mundane. Um, the other thing that informed um, his painterly practice in terms of his theatre work was his painting in glue. Um, because certainly the set designs, um, he used a glue size of, um, uh, that he then mixed um, pigment into, powdered pigment, and he actually called it his cooking. I like his <laughs> use of domestic uh, analogy there. Um, so he would cook up um, uh, large pots of glue that he mixed um, uh, powdered uh, pigments into for his stage, um, for the sets. And he um, learned through that technique to actually bring that into some of his sort of, you know, his more um, conventional paintings as it were. Oh, well that's very marvelous. Advice, uh, I know you and I are both very concerned with the interior. Another um, reader asked, you know, did he do, did he do anything else? Did he ever get outside? The wonderful yeah. garden scenes, parks, landscapes. Okay. Uh, but we'll we'll save that for the next exhibition. <laughs> yes. And uh, Francesca, will thank you so much. It is now very late at night. I hope you are not teaching tomorrow. No, I'm not. <laughs> thank you again for this marvelous lecture. You've just been such a generous colleague, and your uh, wonderful contribution to our catalog, um, your beautiful catalog, and the book that is just stating right now with you in Birmingham. So uh, we look forward to seeing it, and I hope there are many more chances to work together. I just am sorry that we are not welcoming you here in Portland. So we'll, we'll next, next for the next exhibition, okay? Yes, let's do it. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's joined us uh, today. I apologize if we didn't get to every question, uh, but I encourage you to come back and watch this once we have it posted online and to come visit us at the museum. The show is open until January 23rd. All right. Thank you and good night and good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.